Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to Western Australia, welcome to Perth. And I'm Father Doug Harris, and I'm the parish priest of a parish in uh, Glendalock, St. St. Bernadette's. And I've been a priest for almost 20 years, I was ordained in the year 2000, and I have been in this parish for over 16 years. But I, I grew up in New South Wales, in the, in the city of Newcastle. I'm the oldest of, of five children, I went to a, a government primary school. Our family didn't practice the faith, although for a, a short while, our mother took a Protestant church. So she was a Protestant. She's now a convert to Catholicism. Even as a young person, I had a, a desire, a natural desire for our Lord. I remember in kindergarten, wondering if, everyone, if anyone else thought so much about God as I did. It was a very uh, wonderful childhood. Uh, I lived in a, a town called Redhead, and we had a, a nine kilometre beach, and so a, a lot of surfing. I also grew up playing soccer, a great love. M my high school, a Catholic high school, St Pius X. Uh, I went on to the University of, of Newcastle. At the university, I attended Mass. Mass was offered there twice a week, and I attended Mass uh, twice a week. The, I remember the, the uh, chaplain at the university asking me if I'd ever thought about being a priest. And uh, I said, I, I hadn't. I had really very little knowledge of what a priest was. However, he did invite me to spend uh, a year with, with him and some other uh, men who were discerning the priesthood. But after six months, it was decided that I didn't have a call to the priesthood. Many years later, I moved to Sydney and I joined the Disciples of Jesus community. And at one of the prayer meetings, the leader of the prayer group, a Colin Sutton, invited everyone to pray one hour a day. I was 23 years of age. And from that day on, I, I made a commitment to spend one hour a day in prayer. Not long after that, I started going to Mass every day. At this time, people would ask me if I'd ever thought about being a priest. And I had a standard answer. And that answer was that no, I know God wants me, wants me to be married and have 10 children. That was my standard answer. Um, and also at that time, I felt that if God was asking me to be a priest, I didn't have the, the strength to say no to, to marriage. But then 1986, uh, November, St. John Paul II came to Australia for the first time. And he was saying Mass in Randwick in Sydney. And, and I was there in the crowd during the Mass. I had this very strong desire, very exciting desire uh, to be single for the Lord. All I wanted was to give my whole life to Him as a single person. I never since then have even considered marriage. As time went on, that grew to a desire for the, the priesthood. However, I had a, a spiritual director who said that I didn't have a calling to the priesthood, but rather a calling to, be, to remain single or as a religious brother. And I was not sure if he was correct or, or not in his discernment. At the age of 29, I, I said a prayer 
Lord, if you want me to be a priest, then you have to provide. And I, I, my prayer was that by the age of 33, if I didn't have a green light or permission from my spiritual director to enter into the seminary, then I would consider that my desire to be a priest was simply my desire. It was not your desire. It was not God's desire. At the age of 32, I joined a team called the Youth Mission Team, and they were in Perth, Australia. So that's how I moved to Perth to join the Youth Mission Team. And it just so happened that they had a, a, a silent retreat, which so happened to finish on my 33rd birthday. And, and so during this retreat, my only prayer was, Lord, give me a sign to tell me that you wanted, want me to be a priest. Uh, I asked, one of the signs was that he would give me a yellow rose. And I remember praying for this yellow rose, which did not come. So on my 33rd birthday, I woke up and I knew and in, in my heart, I knew then that this desire to be a priest was not, my, was not God's desire. It was only my desire. And therefore, I, I decided then that God did not want me to be a priest. And I was at peace because I had got to that level and, and that was that. And I knew now what God, God's will was and that's all I wanted to know. And so I was at peace. Now that night, we arrived home and it was 11 p.m. And there was, all I remember was there was one envelope in the mailbox. And that envelope was from my spiritual director. And he said that during a week or so uh, before, he had decided that he should release me. He felt this desire that he should release me from his uh, spiritual direction. And that if I still felt the calling to the priesthood, then I was free to seek the discernment of somebody else. A few nights later, I went into a house to, to visit someone and they were talking about two men going to the Philippines to join a community called the Missionaries of the Blessed Sacrament. And this community was set up to establish perpetual Eucharistic adoration. I m mentioned to one of the young men uh, who was going to the Philippines, possibly interested in this order, although I didn't feel anything in my heart. Uh, he went to the Philippines only a few days after uh, this, um, after my 33rd birthday, or maybe a week after. And then a few days later, I received a call from the Philippines from the superior, uh, Father Martin Lucia, the superior of the missionaries of the Blessed Sacrament. to Father Doug's um, story of his priesthood. I'd love to find out more about what had inspired him to become a priest um, and the work that he's done over the years, 20 years it seems, he's a priest next year. So let's find out more. Father, welcome. How are you? Very, very well. Father, as a priest, mm. can you please mm. give us some insights into your faith and the way that you pray? If, you, if, if I, like, I might even say the secret of life, is to spend an hour every day in prayer. So from my early 20s, the age of 23, I made that a commitment. So it's in, in concrete that every day I would spend one, one hour with, with our Lord. Uh, at first, the, the hour began at, at home. I would pray at home. Then it moved on to the church. It was before a statue of, of our mother, Our Lady. I would pray the hour there. And then for some, I don't really know why, but the hour was then before the, the, the tabernacle. And, and I got much more fruit from the, the tabernacle than I did from, uh, from spending time at home or spending an hour uh, in the presence of a statue of our, our mother. I was more, yeah, after, when I, after my discernment to the, the priesthood, when that calling came, I imagined that if I was a priest, I would have a lot of Eucharistic adoration in my parish. Uh, so the beginnings, if you like, that stirring of perpetual adoration began there. A second area of, in my spirituality is, is this uh, divine will. Our, our Lord appeared to a Luisa Piccarata who, who died in 1947 in Italy. Uh, and she, he gave this message, which we now call divine will. 
Uh, Louisa Picarata herself, she had the invisible stigmata. She was, she was very, very holy. Uh, she had no food for 64 years. She was bedridden for uh, 64 years. Among her penances, she had a, a belt around, two, two belts around her, her waist. And the belts had about 50 nails in each belt. So she was very strong in penance, in great, great love for our Lord. And uh, our Lord revealed that in, in these times, he's giving a, a new grace for us to be like, a, a, like our Blessed Mother, to be, for us today to be full of the Holy Spirit or, or full, of, full of grace. And, and it's a gift which is given to all of us to, today, that if, if we say no to our own will and, and say yes to his will, then that, that gives our Lord permission then to, to reign in us, to, in, in his fullness, that, we, that, uh, that fullness of the Spirit. And so that we become, we give permission for our Lord to reign in us completely. And so what, what he did, we, we are now able to do. Um, surrendering our will to him means praying as he prayed, learning to think only as he would think, uh, overcoming sin as he did, rising in virtue as he did. And, but as, as we try to do that, there is a grace. And he, he, he more and more, with that grace, it's, um, it's quite um, wonderful to see how, how we do grow. Um, through, through this grace that's given when we surrender our will. Particularly so for, at his passion, for example, at his passion he gave infinite grace to all creation and that grace um, was given to all creation and that grace that was given at the moment of his passion is still equally powerful today um, simply because that's his intention and, and he's divine. Yeah. And, uh, um, and so and he wants to, to work in us in that way today. And so you mm. said yeah. what yeah. we have to do is yeah. to let go of our will and to embrace right. Right. Yeah. God's will. So is there anything yeah. else, but, so that desire yeah. just to do God's that's will, right. is, was, is there anything else that's needed? That's, that's really all. So we're just um, to give him that, yeah, to give him our, our heart, our desire. And he, he said he'll do the rest. He, he said to Louisa Picarada that he would do, he would make up for any, any lack in, in us. That he, that he would do the rest, yes. Yeah. Okay. So are there uh, any yeah. other prayers that are associated with um, uh, living yeah, in the divine he, will? He recommended to Louisa Picarada, yes, Michelle, um, to begin with a morning offering. And the morning offering is something similar to, Lord, please reign in me in, in your fullness today, in, in every thought, every word, even every heartbeat, every breath, that, that you would reign in me and act in me according to... Um, yeah, to your grace or to your will, um, and and then he, then he he will, he will do that, um, but but still throughout the day, just to, to repeat that prayer throughout the day, just to to keep our focus on on what God is doing, what God wants to do, on, on. so it's a, a it's a sanctity, no, no longer a human sanctity, but a divine sanctity because it, okay. He's working on on His His level. So Father, you mentioned mm. that perpetual Eucharistic mm. adoration mm. was a fundamental part of your priesthood and, yes. and ministry mm. work. Can mm. you please share mm. more about this? Yes. When I was in the seminary, I, I shared about my vision to have perpetual Eucharistic adoration. Although I must admit I was uncertain whether it would be uh, workable in, in, in Australia because of the limited faith and, and small, smaller parishes. Um, but there was a, a priest, a, a Father Eugene McGrath, who's since passed away. He was uh, the parish priest of St Anne's in Belmont. And after I was ordained, he, he said, why don't we, we start, we, we try. Yeah. And his was a very small parish, maybe a hundred people altogether coming to Sunday Mass. So um, it should have been impossible, but we tried. We, we preached at uh, his parish and a number of local parishes. And uh, we, we got, the numbers were, we hardly got anyone to sign up for the night hours, but we got a, a young man who was out of work at the time. And he, he said that he would stay in the chapel. He would sleep, sleep by day and just stay in the chapel at night. Oh, wow. And as people would come in, he would ask them to, to make a commitment to one hour a week yeah. at that hour that they were there. And after 40 days, we had all, all, the, all the hours covered. And so uh, that, that was in 2002. In 2003, we started at uh, Highgate and also Beaconsfield. After that was Bazendine, then here, here at uh, Glendalock, uh, and then other parishes, including Gr Greenwood. Yeah. But uh, from 2006, the, the mission was Indonesia. 
and I travelled with a, a fa Father Hugh Thomas, a Redemptorist priest who was here in Perth at the time. And our first uh, chapel of perpetual adoration was in Surabaya in Java. And then uh, on that same year, 2006, we started in Kuta in Bali. Uh, uh, and then we went to many islands, many, many islands in Indonesia, including Sulawesi, um, Kalimantan, but mostly, mostly the the, uh, the work was in in, Jar, in, in Flores, uh, and uh, we started in a, in a diocese of Mulmeri in in Flores, and, and the bishop himself uh, signed up to do eight a eight p.m. to nine p.m. every day. Oh wow, that's and, awesome! Uh, <laughs> and so they put a special chair for, for the bishop <laughs> um, in in the chapel, so that. Um, in, in Indonesia, people are, are, are much easier prepared to make sacrifices. So we had one uh, on the island of Sumba, uh, not far from Flores. Uh, to, to the, the two priests that we started the, in, in the cathedral in Sumba, uh, one priest did, uh, I think, 12 midnight to 1 a.m. Every, every night, yeah. and the other priest, the assistant priest, did 4 a.m. to 5 a.m., but every night. Um, just, I suppose, one, one story, there was a, a man a businessman um, in, in Indonesia and he and his wife made the commitment to do Monday morning 1am to 2am yeah. but after, after a while they got lazy and they stopped going. The businessman however happened to lose an important document for his business. One morning just, just before 1am uh, his mobile phone rang and he got up to answer the phone but he was too late and there was no number recorded on the phone. Oh. And that happened twice. He got out of bed and he was too late. But then he realised it was the time that he would normally go for his holy hour. Mm -hmm. He got dressed, he went to the chapel, and as soon, he was, as soon as he was in the presence of our Lord in the, in the Blessed Sacrament, he remembered where that important document was. And so after his holy hour, he went straight to his business and there it was. Wow, and, and today, uh, he, he and his wife um, say that they'll never miss their holy hour, 1am to 2am, Monday morning. And he's now the coordinator of the chapel. He's so excited about that, that miracle happening. Uh, there in the presence of, yeah. of our Lord. So Father Doug, um, you do a lot of work in the Archdiocese setting up perpetual adoration chapels. Can yeah. you share yeah. just how this came about? We, we have started a community in order to promote perpetual adoration called, called Apostles of Perpetual Adoration. And that came about, I got a, a call from the Superior of the Missionaries of the Blessed Sacrament, Father Martin Lucia. He suggested that we start our own community here in Australia. And he said, we have a good Archbishop at that time, Archbishop Hickey. So to, for me to then uh, ask him about starting a community to, to promote perpetual adoration. And, and I'm thinking, I, I can't start communities. This is, this is too out there. But I, I made an appointment to see the Archbishop, Archbishop Hickey. And I just suggested this, uh, that we, we'd start a community just to promote perpetual adoration. And he said, why not? So we, eventually I wrote out a constitution and it was approved. And, uh, and now we have, we have three, three brothers, three religious brothers, um, and we have a, about maybe 100 lay members as well. Okay, and, and what's involved with being a member, say, as a okay. lay person? Yeah. The, the minimum commitment is to, to spend one hour in a, in a perpetual adoration chapel to be part of the, the uh, com, uh, commitment to it. But, uh, uh, but of course, one is encouraged to do a lot more. Uh, when, when we run, run missions, they can, they can um, help come, just uh, even hospitality, you know, just to, to greet the people or, or even make, make meals or, or snacks depending on uh, the situation. Father, in your introduction, you mentioned you're a member of the Disciples of Jesus Covenant community. Yes. Um, mm. How are you involved in the community? One of the things is to be a chaplain for a gr group called Miracle Prayers. And Miracle Prayers has been running for about six, six years. And we have a, in, in, um, we have a venue where people come and, and receive healing. But we also go out to the streets. Oh, okay. And we call it a street ministry. So just once a month, we, we um, spend about an hour, maybe two hours on the streets. Norm, we normally, well, recently, we've just always been in the city of Perth and in, in Forest Chase. And, so, and we just, just talk to people, share our faith and ask them particularly if they want prayers because it's our ministry is to bring he um, he um, well, evangelisation through miracles, through healing. Yes. Uh, one, one example, there was a, a, a young man who had a, a motorbike accident and he was in, in a wheelchair 
and we asked him if he wanted prayers, and he, and he, he said yes. We, we noticed that one leg was shorter than the other, and as we prayed, the, the leg well, seemed to grow. It became the same size as the other. Uh, we then asked him to stand up, and he said he, he couldn't stand up because it would cause him too much pain just to put pressure on that leg. Yeah. But he stood up and there was no, no pain. He started walking and there was no pain. Wow, praise God. And so he started praising God. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Is there any advice you could give to um, people who are discerning or thinking about a vocation to the priesthood or religious life? Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a big call. Um, it's, it's, it takes a, I mean, a fundamental to any, any person is, is to want to have their own spouse and children. And so priesthood and religious life is to say no to that, very, that fundamental desire. But, but that is the nature of, of the religious life, is to be a, an offering completely to, to the Lord himself. So one is no longer affected or caught up in distractions. It's, it's a total, total commitment or a total offering to, to him and, and to his, his mission. And so he, and he, he does fulfill that, that gap that, that hole, if you like, that's um, left when one doesn't have a spouse or children. And, and in my own experience, he, f- he fills it completely, well, more than completely. Um, it's, it's a complete fulfillment. I, I wouldn't uh, I have no other, other desire to, to be a priest. Um, as time goes on, that desire, if anything, increases. Uh, I couldn't imagine myself being anything else. I'm, I'm very much fulfilled. And, I mean, it, it, even saying that sounds like an understatement. It's, uh, it's very much yeah, who, uh, who I am. Um, and I'm certainly not, don't lack in, in anything. So I just in, encourage young people to, to have that, um, and, and needs to have that desire to, um, to want to be with the Lord and, and allow Him to, to, to be that you're all and you're everything. Thank you very much, Father. Okay. like to leave one message, and that is to love the Lord as He loves us. That is our challenge. Our Lord loves us to the point where He died on the cross for us. A total offering, we could say, is an offering incarnate. And we are called to offer our lives to Him as He offers His life to us. As He offers His life to us completely at every moment to that degree, we are called to love Him at every moment and offer our lives to Him at every moment at that degree. And for me, practically, uh, one way is through the the rosary, the constant prayer, continually uh, with that spirit of adoration, but also intercession, uh, praying for His intentions, but also for, for whatever intentions come to my mind. to you the Catholic faith in all its different dimensions. It can be a faith to inspire you in in your own living of your Catholic life in society. Salon World offers you an opportunity of being rich and strengthened in your family life. We live in a culture that needs to have a Catholic presence. We live in a culture that needs to be evangelized by the presence of Catholic teaching and the inspiration to live according to our Catholic way of life. I recommend to you you're involved, to be involved in the work of Shalom World. May the Lord bless you and bless the work of Shalom World. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.